neighborhood and of its people who did not want to go. I don't want no money. I want my home. The old man is old. See how the old man is old? No more. That's enough. I don't want to get out. I, I said to my two daughters, they don't want to get out because they spend a lot of money. Plenty of money they spend in this place. We're not getting out for nobody. Never. Hi. Welcome to the West End Video Newsletter. Uh, tonight we have with us Santo Aurelio. Santo has been here before, and he wrote a book called How to Say It and Write It Correctly Now. Uh, he has since updated it by 43%, and it's, uh, I forgot how many pages you have enlarged the 428, Jim. 428 pages. So uh, Santo is a former West Ender, and uh, what happens is you s sit around, you start talking to everybody, and you start reminiscing about the old days, and uh, you, you get into it. And... One thing former West Enders used to do quite a bit was murder the English language. Matter of fact, they would murder the Italian language. <laughs> when I was a kid, there was a uh, uh, large uh, section of the West End that was what they used to call Worcester Neasies. I always thought there were people that came from Worcester. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. <laughs> but the name, the name, it's really Augusta. That's right. But the way Augusta. they would slur it, the, the Sicilians from that area would slur it, they would say, Wustanese, you know, Wooster. <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's strange, but that's, I always thought there were people from Worcester until I was, you know, about eight or nine, but before that, it was, <laughs> I didn't understand it. And so, like I say, they didn't just murder the English language. Well, I guess if you were Jewish or Irish or whatever, you, you murdered your own language because it was such a, a cross, you know, uh, culture, everything going back and forth. Matter of fact, you picked up some words like, that uh, scumbari, which is uh, you know, being embarrassed, <laughs> became uh, uh, part of the, uh, the language in the West End. Uh, even uh, Irish and whatever were using it. And uh, there were a lot of Jewish words that uh, the Goyim were using rather than, oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> rather, rather than you know, uh, just being a purely uh, a Jewish idiom. We, you know, so it was, it, it was that cross-culture and words were added and taken out and... But uh, Joe has written this book, and uh, so why did you write the book again, Joe? Well, I wrote the book because I noticed, and uh, over the years, frankly, uh, and I've lived in a couple of different areas like Belmont and Arlington, that a lot of people would use the uh, wrong English. And if they wanted to change, it would be good if there was a, a book that was easy to understand with simple okay. rules that would help them to write a, a letter that makes sense. Something I remember when I was young, about seven or eight years old, my mother wanted to give me some mushrooms. I said, oh, no, I hate them. That's she right. said, how could you hate them if you never ate them? <laughs> so, and of course she was right. Of course, I was prejudging it, right. and I was prejudiced against right. mushrooms. And I think a lot of people are prejudiced in other ways, too. For instance, mm. if you go for a job, and you're an applicant, and you'd like to get the job, right. sometimes people use the wrong English. They say, she don't like that, instead yeah. of she doesn't like that. Yeah. Or they might say, uh, use a double negative. Yeah. He doesn't know no better, instead right. of he doesn't know any better. Yeah. Uh, a prospective employer may well be prejudiced against you and think that you do not have the smarts mm -hmm. for that job. And of course, he or she would be wrong. Yeah. You, may have, you may have an awful lot of smarts, may be very intelligent. In fact, some of the most intelligent people I've ever known have not had a formal education. But that's okay. That doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. The last thing that I am is an educational snob. Right. Yes, you introduced me as uh, Dr. Rilio, and that's all very nice, and I have a doctorate in education. But I only got a doctorate so that I could teach in college. Mm -hmm. uh, and Because, frankly, I know that my employers in college right. would be prejudiced, and many times they will not hire a person to be a teacher, instructor, and so forth, unless he or she has a doctorate. So... Uh, I would say that one of the main reasons I wrote that book, Jim, mm -hmm. was because uh, I wanted to help people so that they can, if they want to, uh, speak correctly and write correctly. So when they look for a job, that maybe they'll get the job. I mean, just because sometimes a person, you know, uses the wrong English 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that employers are prejudiced against that person and may not give the job to that person. So there are a lot of other reasons, too. It's amazing. Now, conversely, the opposite of that is if one speaks well and writes well, uh, the person to whom one is speaking or the person who gets the letter that you have written may think that you are much smarter than you actually right. are. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I spoke relatively clearly and, and on occasion used a couple of big words, and everyone thought I was a genius, or some people thought I was a genius. Yeah. They couldn't be more mistaken. <laughs> but I got a big kick out of that because they thought yeah. I was intelligent far beyond my, my years yes, of education. Right. And it's amazing. So prejudice works both ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, if for no other reason than that, the book can be a great help. And then, of course, this book has, frankly, an enormous amount of uh, uh, different compartments and departments in it. For instance, there are over 1,100 homonyms, like uh, the maid made the bed. Well, of course, <laughs> the maid, if you're talking about a noun, right. a person, it's spelled M-A-I-D. If you're talking about the verb, it's M-A-D-E, the maid made the bed. Right. Uh, there are some times where there might be three of them, like I'll walk down the aisle on the desert aisle. Now that's spelled three different ways. That can be very tricky. Uh, uh, I was watching a closed captioning on TV the other day, and they had the word road, and it should have been R-O-A-D, and the person who captioned it uh, spelled it R-O-D-E. Uh, and this goes on, and then of course, yeah, when you have words like hoard and hoard, and poor and poor, and principal and principal, well, wait a minute, now that we're talking about principal, <laughs> Let me tell you something that's very interesting. This book has various things, including uh, what they call mnemonic or memory right. devices to memorize this stuff. So principal, principal can be a real killer. I was talking to somebody the other day. She was about 55 years old, and she still can't get that. Yeah. And I said, well, I've got uh, a memory device for you, for the word principal, principal. Why don't you always spell it? P-A-L at the end. Always, always, always. Just one exception. She said, okay, what's the exception? When you mean a rule, like a rule of law, let me see, how do you spell the word rule? R-U-L-E. <laughs> Fine. Then spell that principle, L-E at the end. Otherwise, if you live on Route 3 in Arlington, that's a principal road, P-A-L. Mm -hmm. I know a guy who works in a school, he's a principal, P-A-L. Anything, mm -hmm. I know a guy who's a, the president of a big company like Raytheon, then he's the principal of that company, P-A-L. Anything you can think of would be P-A-L, except, as I say, the P-L-E. Very interesting. I was, I was just on the computer yesterday, and it's funny because my brother sent me a list of homonyms, okay? <laughs> and I forgot most of them, but one of them was uh, the medic uh, wound the wound. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, yeah. And there was a whole bunch of them. That was, that's, that's, that's right. I, that's right. Moment. Yeah. and Polish and Polish and stuff like Polish that, and, and Polish, it goes right. on and on. <laughs> it's really quite remarkable. And there's something else in that book, not just uh, uh, homonyms, but something that I have ca called, uh, I made up the word, I guess, pseudo-homonyms. Now, you know that there's such a word as elicit, like if you want to get information yeah, or yeah, yeah. E elicit information, it's spelled E-L-I-C-I-T, it's a verb, very nice. Mm -hmm. There's also an adjective called illicit, which means illegal, yep. Yep. and that's spelled I-L-L-I-C-I-T. But said quickly, Jim, that sounds alike, illicit, yeah. illicit. Yeah. And so people get really mixed up on that, and it may not bother you uh, or me, mm -hmm. but frankly, it bothers a lot of people, and uh, then they have to hunt for a dictionary if, if they're concerned, and <laughs> it, that takes an awful lot of time. Uh, but when one has uh, in one book among other things, yeah. 1,100, over 1,100 homonyms mm. and pseudo-homonyms, that's quite remarkable. Also, in the English language, there's only eight parts of speech. All eight parts of speech are explained there with many examples. Furthermore, some mm. people get mixed up with legal terms, so I decided to put a Legalese lay person. A whole I know. <laughs> I decided to put in a lay person's legal dictionary in there oh, okay. with over 800 terms. So if one gets a, oh, that, that will has to go to probate. And a lot of people may not understand. The word probate just means yeah. prove, P-R-O-V-E. Yeah. So there's lots of wonderful things there written in language that you and I, can lay people, right. can understand. And also, if people are concerned about medical words, believe it or not, there's 1,109 medical word, word forms in there with uh, succinct, economical, easy to understand explanations yeah. Yeah. and thousands of examples. Yeah. It's really wonderful. I mean, one simple example, I'll just give one. Take the word uh, nose. Uh, the medical prefix for that is rhine, R-H-I-N. 
So let me see. Itis, everybody guess knows that inflammation, itis is inflammation. So if you said, I know somebody who suffers from rhinitis, then that'll be inflammation of the nose. And then there's all kinds of other examples in there. And mm -hmm. so 1109 medical word examples, just so many I'll, other things I'll tell you one word that book. used to confuse me when I was younger. Not confuse me. I, I, I knew what they meant, but what got me was I can, I used to, you know, zeal, right? Zeal? Yeah, zeal. You know, yeah. you have zeal. Yes. Now, I used to say zeal it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I said before. Then, then I realized somebody yeah. pointed out to me it was zealot. <laughs> <laughs> I said before that I uh, knew a lot of words and people, I spoke yeah. clearly. People thought I was smart and all that. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of words that I mispronounced yeah. and very, very embarrassing. Yeah. And that was because, uh, well, I read a lot, but I did not know how to employ a dictionary. Yeah. So although I had a very good, uh, I think, uh, grounding in English and English grammar at the parochial school, mm -hmm. uh, which in the West End we would call the sister school, right. <laughs> uh, Joe, still yeah. uh, uh, there were a couple of things that we could have done more, like uh, going into dictionaries and going on field trips and things like that. Well, we really didn't have a lot of money. If I remember right, uh, uh, they, they weren't even charging at the beginning. I think you went there free. I think then they started right. charging like half a dollar. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, I recall, let me see, I think I was in the fifth grade, and that would be 1943, uh, uh, I believe. And uh, it hmm. was 25 cents for stationary charges per year. Yeah. So, but for poor people as as as, a as as we got older uh yeah. then they started charging like uh, i think it was 50 cents a, a week or something they they instituted oh yes but it was but yes it was, you're younger than i jim yeah. uh, also you have to remember that i had nine brothers and sisters so there's a <laughs> so family the whole family including mother and father were 12 yeah. that's a lot of children right. and uh so uh but in those days you know uh, catholic schools were used and basically what they were used for i found this out later when i was talking to people they were training grounds so that Catholic kids could get jobs in uh, civil service. That's why they made you wear a tie all the time, made you wear clothes, like the dress up with jackets and, and do all the stuff and learn the, you know, the correct procedure, how to talk right. That's true. And it was basically, they were, they were basically yes. training schools for civil service. It's a, a big, uh, even when I went to high school, we dressed rather well. And, mm -hmm. and people who went to college, if anyone could afford it, <laughs> uh, they dressed quite That's well right. and uh, compared to how uh, students at uh, even places like Harvard dress today, including the instructors, the teachers. <laughs> They're the worst. So it's amazing. <laughs> at any rate, I think, you know, relative to, you know, speaking and so forth, that one, uh, there are other parts of that book, too, that one could uh, uh, get a lot of benefit from. A lot of people are mm -hmm. getting mixed up with punctuation. And uh, a lot of people, for instance, with the sentence, I was born in July, comma, 1932, comma, and I was born in Boston. Well, you should put commas there. Yeah. But, you know, there are some magazines, and I think Reader's Digest may be one of them, because of their small columns and newspaper columns that are necessarily right. small, uh, have decided many times to leave out certain commas if it doesn't bother you too much, because when you put in a comma, mm. that means you have to stop with right. your eye. Right. And that's, it's a visual marker for you. And uh, so uh, I can understand that. But in a formal letter, uh, a regular letter that has, mm -hmm. oh, maybe 12 words per line, uh, it's, uh, you, one should really put in uh, the proper punctuation and follow the punctuational rules. And mm -hmm. I have, uh, I think, 20 pages or so uh, in that book just for that purpose, for punctuation. And uh, if the book, as I say, is rather technical. And for those who are really, really concerned, uh, there are even five pages relative to hyphens <laughs> because hyphens can be very, yeah. very, very tricky. Yeah. Well, I think we were talking before the show. Uh, uh, there's, when, you, when you're doing, when you're writing like an essay or you're writing something, you know, to put into a paper and everything, there's an element of style, okay? And sometimes you, can o you overrule uh, grammatical uh, correctness to try to make a point, right? But never should you use do it when you're writing a letter to somebody, I mean, <laughs> especially a business letter or a letter that's, you know. That's true. And all it does is show that you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but that's. Uh, well, a lot of times people end off a letter that says, uh, I am, and then they put in a comma, and then they yeah. say very truly yours. 
But in yeah. a case like that, when you say I am, yeah. you don't need a comma after that. Right. It's a technical point. It's not right. that important, perhaps. Uh, but I mean, if one really wants to be very, very careful about these things, one would, you know, pay attention yeah. to that. Uh, even when people say, uh, I'll meet you tonight at 8 o'clock, yeah. uh, many times people put in 8 colon 0, 0. Uh, I don't know what that means. Yeah. You know, now if it just said 805, that I understand, 8 right. colon 05. But if it's just going to be 8, I would write the digit 8 or write out E-I-G-H-T. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's amazing how many things are done like that, and people just don't realize it. It just dawned on me. It just hit me. Uh, I was reading the USA Today about six months ago. Matter of fact, I brought it to somebody to just to show them, and there was a front page article where they said that, so-and-so would go to, and they had W-O-O-D. <laughs> for, for wood? Yeah. <laughs> I went, what? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's... <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know what I saw just the other day? I think it was yesterday, and it was an important uh, document that I got from, uh, from uh, uh, downloading on TV, on uh, in the Internet. Uh, lead. Uh, you know, a lot of people get mixed up on how to spell lead. Now, as you know, there's... Uh, L-E-A-D, the verb, you're lead, the definitive yeah. to lead. I would like to lead a parade yeah. tomorrow. Well, let me see. Yesterday, I led a parade. Right. That's spelled L-E-D. Right. They're getting it mixed up, and they're spelling it L-E-A-D. <laughs> and you might say, well, that has something to do with the noun, right. you know, uh, like lead pipes, yeah. uh, which is also an adjective, too. Right. But uh, uh, still, the fact remains that I am amazed at how many uh, newspapers and magazines and now on uh, the TV or the thing that I downloaded on the internet, also misspelled it when they're talking about the past tense of the infinitive to lead. Yeah. It's, it's quite remarkable. And all, uh, another thing that is absolutely amazing, breath. Now, the average person takes a breath, right. that's a noun, every few seconds and right. so forth. And that's spelled B-R-E-A-T-H if you talk about a noun. Right. But it's very, very important, Jim, to breathe. And yeah. if you're going to breathe and use the verb... <laughs> then you have to put an E on it. Right. And you can't believe how many people in print are making that error. Yeah. Well, you, you know, on the other hand, uh, what happens a lot of times, and this happens in Old English and everything, is that people start using the incorrect usage, and the incorrect usage becomes proper after that. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the things that I can think of, uh, a lot of people uh, like to say, uh, frankly, Jim, uh, I, uh, I could care less. Right. And if they really think about it, if you could care less... Yeah. You would. Yeah. Therefore, you mean yeah. I could not care less. Yeah. Big deal? Hey, I don't want to come on as uh, too professorial yeah. or too fussy or a fuss budget here, but I mean, if people want to speak correctly, yeah. you know, I can well, help them. You, that book can help them. That's, that's, that's all I'm that's saying. Right. That's, that's what the book's oh, all that's, about. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I, uh, I don't know if I told you. The book really can be bought uh, online. You okay. know, at, uh, I have a website called santoaurelio.com. Uh, Santo, S A N T O. And uh, Aurelio, A U R E L I O dot com. But all it's going to be. Slow up a little when you say that. Oh, that's right. I really <laughs> should. Yeah, that's, that's one of my habits, also. Well, a lot of people do. That's, you know, yeah, they got a lot that's of That's a common, a common <laughs> mistake on television. <laughs> but that, probably mm -hmm. more importantly, though, uh, the book can be purchased at uh, Amazon, yeah. uh, Borders, okay. Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. and all of the. In fact, I was fooling around on the internet the other day, and no kidding. Uh, I saw my book advertised in Korean because oh. I've, I've been to Korea. I served in yeah. Korea 50 years ago. Right. And uh, I was so amazed to see it advertised. And also, they even have it on Amazon.uk, which is the United okay. Kingdom. And which I speaks a whole different English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could help them, too. But uh, it was really amazing. So it is advertised in various places. It can be bought in various venues or places right. and, uh, or even in my uh, own uh, uh, website. Uh, and uh, but uh, I think uh, I think it's good for youngsters. Mm -hmm. I think it's good for oldsters. I think it's good for immigrants who get mixed up, and also people who even have a doctorate. Because I was talking to somebody the other day, frankly, and he came from a very very famous uh, university here, mm -hmm. and he said, uh, "I feel very badly about that situation." You know what I mean? Yeah. And technically speaking, you cannot say, I feel badly about that. The only time you can say, feel badly, is if your fingers are not sensitive enough. <laughs> and if you're a surgeon, you're going <laughs> to operate on me. I hope yeah. you don't feel badly, because I'd rather you not operate <laughs> on me. Technical, yes, yeah. but I'm just saying. These are the things that a lot of people simply don't know. 
and I'm scared that I'm coming on too strong here, but I, I just want to help people out if they want to be helped. I, it, it's funny, because maybe it's <laughs> cosmology, okay? As that I was talking to somebody down in the museum the other day, okay? And they wanted to know how they could learn how to write, okay? <laughs> You know what I mean? So there, there are people out there that, yeah. you know, and th they have this idea that they would like to, you know, write a story or a short story, or they would like to do like an essay, or, or maybe, you know, whatever. And, you know, this would help them. Uh, you know, at least it, it would put it in the, in, in the context. Like yes. I say, they, say, if you want to make a point, okay, you can break some of the rules. But, you know, you can't do it. Uh, you Right. A lot of people are nowadays doing memoirs or writing mm. stories, and it's very interesting, and it's very nice. But, you know, a lot of people are, are engaging in what I call, uh, what I called fragments. Like they say, uh, the store that I went to last night, well, what about it? You know, you, you mm. haven't said anything. <laughs> now, I've said the store that I went to last night had a fire. Right. Ah, now had is yeah. the, uh, the verb. You've got to mm. have a subject and a verb for a sentence. Right. Have to have it. And... Uh, so uh, people are engaging in fragments, and a fragment is something that doesn't have a subject and a predicate, doesn't have, you know, the noun and the verb. And uh, it's too bad. And also people uh, don't realize that when you finish your thought, mm -hmm. you should put in the period. Yeah. I went to the show last night. Yeah. Now you can put oh. in your period. You want to continue on? Fine. Then you'll have to put in, you know, most of the time a comma. And I saw my mother there, or, you know, yeah. whatever you're saying. Uh, the main thing is to write in such a way that whoever reads whatever you have written understands it. And if he and or she flows, has a question, yeah. right, if right. he or she has a question, you have failed as a writer. That's right. And, and, when you, and furthermore, when you, uh, I'm not, when I just, I'm using the general you, of course, Jim. Mm -hmm. But when a person, when you're speaking to a person and the person uh, uh, has to ask you a question, uh, about something he or she doesn't yeah. understand, you'll fail. I remember uh, one person was talking to me some time ago, and she said, Mary and uh, uh, Barbara went to the show. She didn't like the picture. Well, I don't know who you're talking about. Now I have to ask, <laughs> who, who, who Which didn't one, like yeah. the picture? So, uh, I I again, one is not thinking. Mm. And uh, if one wants to speak, as I say, if one wants to speak correctly, mm. or if one wants to write correctly, certain rules and I think a lot of them, frankly, are commonsensical, mm -hmm. have to be uh, obeyed and followed so that one can have a good time speaking and writing. And, you know, I really don't want to come on too strong here. I just want to say that if one feels that this is important, and for a lot, for a lot of people it is important to speak right. and write correctly and not have people make fun of us, especially those who are immigrants, I, I must admit, you know, I'm an old West Ender, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Some people, frankly, did make fun of my father because he spoke broken English. Broken That's English, unfortunate yeah. because, you know, my father spoke Italian and English. Mm -hmm. How many people in America are uh, bilingual? Well, now probably the immigrants that are coming in now. Probably. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, I frankly love immigrants. In fact, when yeah. I did my master's thesis, it yeah. was on Italian and Jewish immigrants yeah. and how they were so alike That's right. in so many ways in the area of Boston, uh, some uh, 80, 90 years ago. It was very, very interesting. I did a lot of research on it. Well, it's strange because Boston was one of the most segregated cities in the country. Now, I'm not talking about black and white. Yes. That too, but there was Irish sections, Italian sections, and the only two sections that I knew of that were uh, racially and, and uh, ethnically mixed were the West End and the New York streets, both of which would take a biometer domain, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, we mentioned before about yeah. all the wonderful languages of the West End. Mm. I recall there was a uh, Jewish uh, candy store owner who liked me a lot. In fact, I looked like his son. Unfortunately, yeah. his son died. Mm. And so the, the mother, every time she saw me, she would cry. Mm. Uh, they taught me Yiddish words, and I loved it. And they oh, yeah. taught me how to count up to 100 in Yiddish, and I could still do it. Yeah. And uh, as far as Polish, I, I uh, just really do like the Polish people. My mm -hmm. sister married uh, into a Polish family. And I, I, I just love the mother there. She lived across the street from you, in fact, the Antonius family. Yeah. And uh, she taught me some uh, words in Polish. And I just, uh, I liked it. I liked yeah. it an awful lot. And I'll never forget how kind so many of the people were there. Yeah. And uh, the Jewish people whom I knew, the Polish people whom I knew. Uh, and, but, of course, I couldn't say speaking Irish or 
And yeah. there was only a couple of German oh, well, people. I, this Irish, I never learned any German. I, the Irish basically uh, basically used the the English language. In, uh, yeah, I, I knew of there wasn't that much Gaelic. Gaelic. Yeah, no, yeah. no Gaelic. The, or little, little and little French, enough. I just don't remember anyone speaking French. There, there were very few family mm -hmm. French families, and there were very few actually there were very few Protestant families too. We'll say like uh, English. But you know, that was strange because there were there were online English people that had trust funds and everything and that decided to stay in the West End and live there. Oh, yeah. Which I found sort of, you know, That's everybody true. else was everybody yeah. else was dirt poor and they and they were still living, you know, in the West End because yeah. they they thought it was a good place to be. It was an interesting area while it lasted and uh, of course as you know the uh, horrible case of urban renewal uh, which brings to a point <laughs> that I wasn't even thinking about. I was reading the paper today and in New London there is, it's going, it's court, this case is going to the Supreme Court. They're trying to take these houses and give it to Pfizer so that they can enlarge their uh, physical plants or physical <laughs> area, and, and they're in court. And I found out that the BRA wrote a friend of the, uh, of the New Haven, whoever the uh, taking authority is, and, you know, they keep saying in, in Boston that that could never happen again. And then they are s writing friends of the brief so that they can make sure it will happen again. Yeah, you know, yeah that's I, right, yeah. You know what I mean? It's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's too bad. You know, it's one thing, as I've said before, and I know you've said it before, yeah. and I'm sh maybe every commonsensical person would say it too. It's one thing if there is eminent domain and the government takes over a property for a school, a highway, a prison, a hospital, something like that, mm -hmm. but for private interest to come in and to promise my mother, as they did, <laughs> uh, a, a low-cost apartment, which she never got, and yeah. then build these wonderful places. Well, the, city, the city was, I was on a panel with uh, Chester Hartman, who was, uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, part of the, the, all what was going on, and he did, he was under Mark Fried and did the psychological impact study. And he said the city was extremely proud that they took the West End at a third of the time, and they said it would, at a third of the cost. <laughs> you know what that means? Yes. And there's another thing. It's quick take. A lot of people don't really, and it's still going on to this day. It doesn't happen around here anymore because they're, around here they get a little, you know, tested. Yeah. And they take your property for a dollar, and somewhere down the line they pay you. But in the meantime, if you're house poor and you can't afford to buy another house, you have to pay rent to the city. You subsidize the taking of your own house. Not, uh, yes, not only that, I had a friend whose father did extremely well, so well that he owned something like 10 to 15 houses, right. like three families or four families right. in the West End. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, I talked to him, and he told me that his father got very, very little money, well, like four, five, six thousand dollars per house. Yeah, but you, you know, Can you know you the reason is? Yeah. Let me explain. They went from Originally, eminent domain it was used for public use, like right. you say, school, whatever. In the 50s, they lowered it to public purpose, which meant that you could, you could take a slum. Well, I guess that's for another show, Santo, and uh, why don't we get back to where, where they can buy this book for you. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, the book can be purchased at uh, Amazon.com and also at uh, Borders, Barnes & Noble, and other stores, and... Uh, and also at my website, Santo Aurelio, you know, www.santoaurelio.com, with no underlinings and no spaces. And uh, at any rate, it's a good book, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, whether young or old, uh, educated or uh, immigrants just coming into the country, can benefit. Right. If you want to educate yourself, it's perfect. Oh, well, yes, certainly. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Because it's, co it's common everyday language. Y yeah. Simple to read and understand, Jim, yes. Well, you've made yourself, uh, you're sort of a self-made man. You've come out of the West End and you've, you know, you've built yourself up to, the to this point where you, you got your doctorate and everything. And that's to be commended because a lot of people, a lot of us didn't. But a lot of us made, made our mark oh, in other ways. The West yeah. Enders have done very, very well, I think. I'm proud so, of them. Uh, I guess we'll see you at the next West End video newsletter.